All right, it looks like it's about 4.04. And so I think I'm going to begin. Uh, those uh, who are uh, on time, uh, you will have the benefit of hearing the entire hour uh, right from the start. So uh, friends, all of you who are joining in, it is my pleasure uh, to welcome you to this special webinar uh, titled The Untold Story of the Dorchester Tragedy. And that uh, this webinar is featuring our special uh, guest researcher and scholar, the author of a brand new volume on the Dorchester called The Immortals. Uh, that gentleman is uh, next to me in the window next to me, Professor Stephen T. Collis, who is a clinical professor of law at the University of Texas School of Law. And we will also be welcoming uh, some very special guests who will be participating in this webinar together with me and Professor Collis. So uh, they will be joining us on the screen in just a little bit. Uh, that would be, of course, uh, Ms. Sharon David, who, as you will hear, is the granddaughter of one of the uh, uh, featured uh, characters in this particular uh, true story, the granddaughter of Charles David Jr. And we will also have the uh, honor of having uh, Gail and Adam Artiglier, uh, or Artiglier as they pronounce it, uh, the daughter and the grandson of Robert Anderson, who was actually on the Dorchester that day in February, 80 years ago. I'm gonna say a little bit more about Professor Collis in just a minute, but before doing so, friends, permit me just to say a few words of introduction to our webinar. Uh, my name is Gary Zola and I and privileged to serve as the executive director of the Jacob Rader Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives. And I am a professor of the American Jewish experience on the historic Cincinnati campus of Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. This institution is the oldest continuously existing institution of higher Jewish learning in the United States. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's special webinar, which by the way, is being jointly sponsored by two of Cincinnati's historical gems, the American Jewish Archives and the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. And we want to extend a special and very warm welcome, not only to our guests who are speaking to us today, but also to all of you who are online and especially to those of you who might be here for the first time tuning in to uh, a webinar sponsored by the AJA. Uh, no doubt we want to introduce ourselves to you. So let me just say that the American Jewish Archives, which is located on the Cincinnati campus of Hebrew Union College, was founded in 1947 by the distinguished historian and pioneering scholar of the American Jewish experience, Dr. Jacob Rader Marcus. And for more than 75 years, the AJA has grown steadily. And it is today, we believe, the world's largest freestanding research center dedicated solely to the study of the American Jewish experience. And the AJA's fundamental mission is to preserve and to promulgate the history of Jewish life in America. I also want to say a word about the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, which, as I said, is co-sponsoring today's webinar. Uh, the Freedom Center is the preeminent cultural learning center for inclusive freedom, both locally, nationally, and actually globally. Building on the principles and the lessons that we learned from the Underground Railroad during the Civil War period and the antebellum period, the Freedom Center exists in order to pursue inclusive freedom by promoting social justice for all. And finally, we're thankful to our other friends who are co-sponsoring today's uh, webinar, the Jewish Community Relations Council of Cincinnati and the Cincinnati chapter of the American Jewish Committee. 
Thank you all for your support and friendship. Now, before I introduce our distinguished guest speaker, permit me just to say a word or two about technology. Uh, on your screen, you'll see today right now, just those who are speaking, the whole uh, 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 checkerboard square that we're used to seeing on Zoom, of course, we're not going to see. And uh, we will bring on our other guests after uh, Professor Collis uh, makes his presentation. Uh, you see that the chat feature is working and you are free to pose your questions as we go into the chat because my colleagues at the American Jewish Archives will be collecting the questions and we'll be able to answer, we hope to answer as many as we can towards the end of our webinar. And then at the conclusion of this webinar, there'll be a few brief and very important announcements, especially for those of you who are interested in purchasing uh, Professor Collis's book. And so uh, don't jump off prematurely if you are interested in acquiring the book. Uh, we want you to uh, 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 stay on so we can tell you how to obtain a copy. And finally, tomorrow, you'll be receiving a follow-up mailing so that you can remain in touch with the American Jewish Archives and receive notification of future educational programs that we sponsor. So, uh, uh, the, and, and then of course, you have the option of, of acquiring a, 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 a uh, a recording of our webinar. And uh, we'll remind you of how to access that recording at the end of our webinar. So now finally, without delay, any further delay, let's begin. Uh, Stephen Collis researches and teaches on, America, on religion and law and other First Amendment topics at the University of Texas School of Law. Prior to joining the law fac uh, faculty at Texas, Mr. Collis was a research fellow in the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford Law School. Mr. Collis has published several volumes, including a volume titled Deep Conviction, which brings to life the history of free exercise law in the United States. And in addition to this book that he has just published on the immortals, on the four chaplains and on Mr. David, which is the focus, of course, of our uh, webinar, Mr. Collis has also published a book titled Praying with the Enemy, which is based on a true story of an American POW during the Korean War and a North Korean soldier who become unlikely allies united in a shared faith in God during a daring uh, escape to freedom. So if you buy the immortals and you like what you read, you want to make sure that you get yourself also a copy of Praying with the Enemy. Now, Mr. Collis, and I hope he'll say a word about this at some point, actually came to Cincinnati to make use of the American Jewish Archives, which is how I first met Mr. Collis. And uh, when he was here researching on Rabbi Good and the Dorchester. And uh, we have then be, had a chance to become acquainted and, and to stay in touch. So uh, I know we're in for a treat today. And it's with that that I am happy to turn the floor over to Professor Stephen Collis. Professor Collis. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zola. I, I noticed somebody in the chat said they, I don't know if they can see me or not, but I assume somebody on the back end will be dealing with all of that uh, on the technology aspect of it. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm grateful uh, for your hosting this, and I should hire you to help sell books for me. That would be a good um, a good partnership we could have together. Um, I want to uh, especially say how grateful I am for the American Jewish Archives and for the Freedom Center for hosting this. Uh, this is the 80th anniversary of the events that uh, I detail in the Immortals this month. And so it's uh, it's an important time this year to, to reflect back on what the four chaplains did that night and on Charles David. And I'll jump into that in a little bit. As I get into my story, I'll tell a little bit more about... Um, how much help the American Jewish Archives were to me. And then I'll also share another story for, uh, about Rabbi Good that actually I don't think is any in any archives anywhere, but someone who read my book reached out to me and shared a personal story that I'd like to share with your audience tonight. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. 
And I'm going to show some pictures and other images related to what's in the book. I'll talk through all that for a little while, and then we will we'll have other guests come on who are the descendants of people actually involved that night. And uh, it'll be great to hear their perspectives and on what the heroism and sacrifices that were made 80 years ago have meant to them in their own lives uh, today. So let me let me share my screen. And Gary, can I get a thumbs up from you? Is that working? Can you see it? Okay, thumbs up. All right. I can't I can't hear you, but I I saw the thumbs up, so I'll assume we're okay. Yeah. Yes, no, you're fine and uh, you've got the full screen uh and uh, this is a picture it says United Germany versus fractured United States. All right. So the, the way I wanted to set the table on this, the the Immortals is an all true account. I don't I don't make up any facts in it. It's not it's not a fiction based on a true story. It's it's narrative nonfiction. But at the beginning of World War II, or at least the beginning for the United States, when Germany, in particular when Hitler declared war on the United States, when he got up and he gave this speech, he emphasized again and again and again about how united Germany was going to be and how there was simply no way a fractured United States could ever possibly compete with a Germany as united as it was under Nazism. And he hit on this theme again and again and again, and it wasn't just rhetoric. I, in my research, I found records of Hitler late at night when he would just sit around after dinner pontificating on whatever he was pontificating on. There were people who would actually write down every word he said because they actually thought this would be important for posterity. And he hit this theme again and again and again, this idea that the United States was simply too fractured of a country. Uh, he, he especially mentioned how fractured the United States was along racial lines and on religious lines, and how he just didn't think a country like that could ever hope to compete in a war with a united Germany. And here's what's interesting about this is if you go back to the time, I mean, we are, the United States is the most religiously diverse and racially diverse country in world history. And Hitler was not necessarily wrong. There were lots of fractions. There were lots of schisms, just like there are today, but it was even worse back then. And one theme I hit on in the book that we law and religion scholars talk about a lot is something called the Puritan mistake. We like to say that the Puritans came to these shores to what became the United States uh, for religious freedom. And it's true, they did. But they were really interested in religious freedom only for themselves. Uh, as far as they were concerned, everybody else could just leave Massachusetts. And they they literally passed laws saying that you had to practice as a Puritan or you could leave Massachusetts. And we refer to that as the Puritan mistake because it's this common human mistake that almost all people tend to be guilty of at one point or another of wanting freedom for ourselves, but not for others. And we see that mistake, you know, throughout world history. We see it in the world today, and we saw it throughout United States history. And so at the time Hitler's declaring war on the United States, the Puritan mistake was alive and well. It was alive and well among religious groups, which really had a hard time working together and finding common ground despite their religious differences. And we certainly saw it uh, among racial groups, differences in races. This was a real problem. And it was it was as evident as anywhere else in the military where many black uh, men could not serve or if they could serve, they were limited uh, in the rank that they could progress to. So think of that background when the United States enters into World War II. And into that environment, uh, you have five men that come along. The first four we often refer to as the immortal chaplains. So Father John Washington, uh, well, I'll do it in order of my picture here. So you've got George Fox, who was a uh, Methodist, Father John Washington, Rabbi Alex Good, and then uh, Minister Clark Poling, who was of the um, Dutch Reformed Church. These four men all signed up to be chaplains. Um, I won't go through all of their stories now, but I do in the book. I, I just, for lack of time, I couldn't go through it all now. But each of these men signed up. The one that's the most fascinating in terms of his past history was George Fox, far on the left here, because he had served in World War I as a chaplain and had actually broken his back in World War I, but signed up again uh, to join in World War II. All of them, but Father Washington, of course, were married. Um, so they were their families were making sacrifices as well. But these men 
all sign up to join the chaplaincy. And at the time, one of the things that the military was actually uh, ahead of the game on was recognizing that they needed a chaplaincy that could serve all servicemen. They needed a chaplaincy that could work with everyone. And so they, they worked very, very hard to make sure that those men who rose up to become chaplains would be people who could be very, very, very strong in their own faith and have a deep conviction of their own religion and background, but also were not afraid to uplift and help others, even if those people were of a different religion and background. That was a key goal that the military set. So as these chaplains came, they all got put on the same ship, which was the Army Transport Dorchester. They all got assigned to this ship, um, and that ship was going to be leaving New York and traveling up to Newfoundland and then setting across the Atlantic to Greenland. And if you know anything about the beginning of World War II, that was a, a terribly fraught journey because U-boats, uh, Nazi Germany recognized very quickly that if they could cut off ships traveling across from North America to Europe, they could basically cut off most of the supply chains and prevent the United States from influencing the war. And so U-boats were attacking relentlessly. So this was a very scary assignment that these men received. At the same time, we had Charles David Jr. So I did not know about Charles when I set out to write this book. And, and here's where some of my, my research came in uh, with the American Jewish Archives. I had learned about the four chaplains because there had been a stamp made uh, in their honor after World War II. And on the stamp, it said interfaith in action, which was something that was unique to the United States. And I, I said, well, someday I want to tell that story. So I had done all this research on the chaplains. And as part of that, I went, I traveled uh, to Cincinnati. I got to spend a couple of days at the American Jewish Archives. They have in their archives there all of uh, Rabbi, Chap, uh, Rabbi Good's papers and documents. And I think they have one of his robes and all sorts of wonderful stuff. And I think Professor Zola is going to share some of that with us in a little bit. But I was able to dig into his journals, some of his, 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 his uh, sermons, his a book he had written that he never published, but he was working on his thinking on democracy and freedom and, you know, love towards all. It was really great. Some of his thinking just on, on how he went about his duties as a rabbi. It was, it was wonderful for me to just get a glimpse into who he was and his thinking at the time, including his relationship uh, with his wife. I was able to do all that through the American Jewish Archives. I researched the other chaplains. And at the time, my book this was all, by the way, before the pandemic. And then, and then in the middle of the pandemic was when I was doing a lot of the primary drafting. Um, but as I really got into more of the research, I came across the record of Charles David Jr. He was not on the army transport that the chaplains were on. Charles was on one of the Coast Guard cutters. And I'll tell his story in just a little bit of why he was so important. But about halfway through, about probably two thirds of the way through drafting the book, when I learned about Charles, I realized I needed to tell his story with as much depth as I was telling the story of the chaplain. So I called up my editor at my publisher and I said, look, I know I'm under a deadline and I know this book's called The Immortal Chaplains, but we're going to change the title to The Immortals and you need to extend my deadline because I got to learn about this guy, Charles David, and he wasn't a chaplain. So we can't call the book The Immortal Chaplains anymore. And uh, thankfully, my editor immediately agreed. They extended my deadline, which in case, if you don't know anything about publishing and especially publishers who actually care about making money, they don't change deadlines very often. Uh, they're on a tight schedule and they need things to be cranked out. So I give them tremendous credit for working with me on that. And then I started just hunting to learn everything I could, not just about the chaplains, but about Charles David Jr. and, and the, one of the most helpful people in that whole process is with us today, and you'll get to hear from her in a little bit. But let me explain a little bit about why these four chaplains and Charles David kind of really seared themselves into United States history and, 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 and why they deserve the title of the Immortals. So the ship from that the chaplains were on was called the Dorchester. It was a used to be a luxury uh, you know, um, ocean liner. It's converted into a uh, military transport ship. It goes up to Newfoundland and it is protected by three Coast Guard cutters. Charles David is on one of those cutters. They go up to Newfoundland and while they're in Newfoundland, they're there for just a short time. 
tension is very, very high. There was a lot of belief at the time that there were Nazi spies everywhere, and especially in Newfoundland, where American ships were traveling across the ocean. And so there were these signs up everywhere like this across Newfoundland, essentially warning soldiers, never talk about where you're going, never talk about your destination, never talk about when your ship is leaving port or where it's supposed to go, because spies will then relay messages to the Nazi U-boats and the U-boats will be hunting you. Turns out that may have been more paranoia than reality, but it was a very real concern of people at the time. Looking back, it doesn't appear that there were nearly as many spies as people feared, but, but the fear was real and it was there and it was palpable. So then the Dorchester leaves and it's, it's escorted by these cutters. They start going across the Atlantic towards Greenland. And to give you a sense of just how bad this was, this journey, the temperature plummeted very quickly into the trip and ice started forming everywhere. The seas were just, just angry. And you had sea spray coming on top of the boat. This is an image from one of the Coast Guard cutters where the ice was just forming on top of the ship. And it got so bad that at several points, the entire group had to stop and break off the ice and shove it over the side because the ships couldn't handle the weight of this ice that was accumulating on them. Having to stop to remove the ice was incredibly dangerous because the, the longer they moved, the more it gave an opportunity for Nazi U-boats to zero in on their location. So this picture here you can see was actually provided to me from one of our guests um, uh, that will be coming on in a little bit, but just gives you a sense of just how thick and dangerous this ice was. And then you also have to think about what these cold temperatures meant. If somebody were to get thrown into the water or if a ship were sunk, science suggests they might be able to last 20 minutes if they were in the water without any type of protective gear on and not much longer even with protective gear. The water was just deadly. It was cold. The winds were harsh. Uh, they couldn't see anything, and they're trying to get across this this span of the ocean where Nazi U-boats had just had tremendous success. One of the other things I was able to find in my research was the journal of the Nazi U-boat captain who was hunting the Dorchester. So uh, his name was Karl Jörg Wachter. He, all of the Nazi U-boat captains were required to keep a log, and he kept a pretty detailed one, including really minute by minute almost details of what he was doing when he was trying to hunt the Dorchester. So I go back and forth in the narrative between telling the story of what's happening on the Dorchester, what's happening on the Coast Guard cutters who are supposed, their job is to watch out for the U-boats, and then what was actually happening on the U-boat as it got closer and closer and closer. And we know the U-boat's exact location throughout the night including what Captain Wachter was seeing. Um, at one point, Wachter was not sure if he had found this, this convoy or not. And he surfaced his U-boat and was looking. And what he recorded in his journal was that the clouds had kind of parted and he could see the northern lights. And against the northern lights, he could see the silhouette, the shape of the Dorchester. And so he knew where the American ships were and he fired on them. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing now and just tell the story. Um, what really thrust these men uh, into immortal status that night was uh, the U-boat successfully hit the Dorchester, and the Dorchester started sinking immediately. It was a very fast sinking. All four chaplains were on the upper deck. They were seasoned. They were older. It would have been very easy for them to just to go get on a lifeboat and sail away, and they could have done that. And yet the reports that came back from that night were that all of these chaplains ended up sacrificing everything they had and they could to help other people of very different religions uh, survive that night. <clears throat> About 200 people made it off the ship and the chaplains played a huge role in helping them get off. They gave up their gloves. They gave up their own life vests. They gave up at one point, one of them undid their shoelaces and used their shoelaces to tie flotation devices to some of the um, people who were able to get off the ship. And these men were able to either get into lifeboat, lifeboats or they were able to just get into the water. Now, keep in mind, the water was just brutal. 
Um, most people died very, very quickly when they got into it. Some were fortunate enough to be able to get into some kind of a wooden life boat or some other floating, whatever you can, was out there in the water. But it was just pandemonium. Um, and the last thing that some of the survivors recall seeing is these four chaplains holding arms together, locked in arms. The ship is sinking and they're, they're standing together on the part that's still out of the water, uh, locked in arms and praying together, each one in their own tradition. That was some of the last things people saw as the ship went under. So it just gave you a sense of their selflessness, of their devotion to their own faith, they never want to sacrifice their own beliefs or their own religions, but also their willingness to, to give themselves up and to be selfless to serve other people. And, and just to give you a sense of it, one thing I chronicle in my book is that these men, this is who they were. It wasn't just that night in an act of heroism. It was kind of how they lived their lives. And I got this story about Rabbi Good. Since we're at the American Jewish Archives for this, I got this story after the book came out from a woman a woman who read the book in Utah, she said, she sent me this email. She said, um, I especially like the story you shared about Alexander Good when he first moved to Goldsboro, North Carolina. So after, after Rabbi Good became a chaplain, he had to go to North Carolina for a little while. And he went around trying to find homes. And nobody would give him a home, him and his wife, a home to rent because he was Jewish. In fact, there was one woman who opened and finally one woman opened the door and she said, yeah, I'd, be, I'd love to rent. I, we have a room. We'd love to rent it to you. And then she found out they were Jewish and she was about to close the door on them. And then uh, Rabbi Good kept talking to her and she changed her mind and eventually let them have a place to stay. So they had this, they experienced this prejudice, you know, immediately getting out of the chaplaincy training where all of the training was, hey, we all need to help each other here. Then they would go back into the real world and realize there's a lot of prejudice. Um, so here's the story from this woman. It says, hearing that he went door to door looking for a place for him and Teresa to live and how when he finally found a possible place, the woman almost didn't let Alex and Teresa live there because they were Jewish touched my heart. Here is my personal connection. Not long after the goods experienced, a young Mormon Army Air Corps lieutenant named Cloyd Goats and his wife, Mary from Utah, were transferred to Goldsboro and needed a place to live. They also went door to door trying to find someone who would let them rent a room. They couldn't find anyone, but the goods generously welcomed them into their home to live. They became fast friends. They introduced Mary to seafood, which she had never had before. And not long after that, Alex was sent to serve on the Dorchester. This young couple from Utah, a number of years later, adopted three children and raised them. And I am the youngest of those three kids. My parents throughout my upbringing frequently shared stories of their friendship with Alex, Teresa, and their daughter, Rosalie. In fact, for more than 50 years, my mother exchanged letters around Christmas time or Hanukkah with Teresa. I just thought that was an amazing story and such a neat connection to share here uh, with the audience of the American Jewish Archives to give you a sense of, of Alex Good and who he was, not just that one night, but throughout his life. Now, that said, the story of the chaplains was often told and um, kind of only told half the story. It was often shared about the chaplain saying this prayer, and I think it's safe to assume, given who they were, that part of what they were praying for was that the men that they had helped off the Dorchester would survive, that they would get some help. And uh, Charles David represented, in my mind at least, the answer to that prayer. So Charles David was on the Coast Guard Cutter Comanche. The Comanche was ordered to immediately try and go look for survivors, even though there was a possibility of U-boats still being in the area. The Comanche found um, a number of pockets of survivors. And here's what's interesting. Because of ju the just explicit racist policies at the time in the Coast Guard, Charles David was not allowed to serve as anything more than a cook. And so that was he was a petty officer, but that was basically as high as he could get on the ranking on the ship. He was the fifth lowest ranking person on the ship. They found a lifeboat with a number of survivors on it barely alive, just clinging to life. Many of them had actually already died. The captain of the Comanche ordered people to go into the water to save these survivors. And most of the men figuratively froze. They couldn't bring themselves to do it because the water was just too cold. The conditions were just too deadly. And so Charles David and a few other officers leapt in and started pulling people off this lifeboat. 
and saving people's lives. The, uh, the, the really powerful part of the story is one of the officers who leapt in was a man named Robert Anderson. He was one of the officers on the Coast Guard cutter. He also leapt in and he went out on the lifeboat to see if there were any men still alive. Think of the horrible conditions under which he was operating. He was having to turn these men over and look into their eyes and just see if they had any life left in them. And if they did, he would hand them to Charles David, who would then crawl up a net and get them back on board the cutter where they could be taken down for medical help. Robert Anderson was out on this lifeboat and the captain of the Coast Guard cutter thought that the rescue was over for that part of it. And so he ordered the ship to leave. And Robert Anderson was still sitting on the lifeboat as he watched his Coast Guard cutter leave. Now you have to think about these conditions. Once that ship leaves, he's dead. Uh, they're not going to be able to find them again. They won't be able to get back. And, and and even just turning back would take at least a half hour, given the, the way they had to navigate the waters. So he's on, Robert Anderson is on the lifeboat. He sees the ship leaving. Charles David is back on the cutter. And he knows Robert Anderson is out there. Uh, as a cook, it's not really his place to run up to the captain and tell him what to do. But you can see the leadership skills of Charles David. He went and sprinted to the captain and he said, we still have a man out there. And uh, to the captain's credit, he listened to Charles. He turned around. It took him 30 minutes, but they went back and they saved Robert Anderson's life that night. And, and later on, Robert Anderson testified that Charles David saved his life. Those kinds of stories happened again and again throughout the night. And that small group of men with Charles David and Robert Anderson um, and another man named Dick Swanson leading the way, saved about 100, about half of the men that the chaplains had helped get off the Dorchester that night. What made Charles David, uh, what made his sacrifice so important was that he already felt a cold coming on that night before he started jumping into the ocean again and again and again. And uh, that cold turned into pneumonia and just a short time later, he died in a field hospital in Greenland. So the chaplains and Charles David all sacrificed themselves. And, you know, what I find so powerful about this story, the sad story of these men sacrificing themselves, but they all did it for people who are very different from them and probably people who at many times treated them with a great deal of prejudice. They set that aside. They forgave that. They set themselves aside uh, and really did heroic acts that night, leading to thousands of descendants of these people who lived because of their heroic acts. So for me, it's a very powerful story. I'm thankful for the opportunity to be able to tell it. I'm grateful for the American Jewish Archives and all the help with the research for uh, Sharon David, who will be joining us in a little bit and all of her help me when I was researching the life of Charles David. And uh, I'm thankful to be able to share it here tonight. So uh, Gary, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was just an excellent presentation. Uh, there's, uh, friends, I have read the book. It, it's a very, it's actually a page turner. I, I really believe, uh, and I'm not just, uh, saying this, that, you know, it, the story, as you could hear is so gripping to begin with. And, uh, uh, it, you, you end one chapter on one of the, uh, clergy or on, uh, Mr. David, and then you want to go on to the next. Uh, so thank you for doing it, and and so it's such a nice uh, way. What uh, what I'd like to ask uh, my colleagues at the American Jewish Archives, if you would be nice enough now to bring back our special guest. Uh, and while that's happening, uh, I want to remind everybody that if you do have questions, or uh, you know, uh, I know a lot of people have put into the chat uh, they knew this one or they knew that one, and. Uh, we, we certainly hope everyone will read that in the chat, but if there are questions that come along, I hope you'll uh, put them in the chat so we can pose them in a bit. Just before uh, our guests return to uh, the screen, which they're doing right now, uh, I'm going to share my screen and uh, just show you a few of the uh, gems that. Uh, we uh, we have at the American Jewish Archives relating to this story. Um, Stephen, can you see okay the share screen now? Great. So uh, 
this is uh, really a very famous letter uh, that we have at the American Jewish Archives. And, uh, you know, after the crisis, as uh, Professor Collis knows, uh, there were, of course, lots of uh, investigations and inquiries and stories told. And uh, as you can, some of you can see uh, up at the top of this letter, and this is the original we have at the American Jewish Archives, uh, a chaplain had been collecting information about uh, Rabbi Good. And uh, this chaplain's name was uh, Josh, Joshua Cohen. He was a graduate of the Jewish Theological Seminary. And he writes out uh, to uh, Chaplain uh, Cohn, he writes some of his story out. And we have that letter here. And I, I just uh, transcribed it for you on the left side of the screen. And uh, I just want to read quickly what it says. Uh, it, it, it's, it sort of adds to what, uh, what Professor Collis pointed out. It, 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 I'm starting where it says, about the chaplain good whom I know you are interested in, I would put him down as a regular guy and a very good shipmate. In proof thereof, I recall very well, after putting on my parka and life preserver, I went out to the promenade deck where I might say confusion reigned. There I found I had no gloves. Chaplain Good was handy and remarked to him, uh, and, and I guess he means, and I remarked to him of my predicament, and I added, I'm going back to get them. Never mind, he said to me, I have two pair, and I will give you one pair of them. I agreed, and he peeled off a, a pair of gloves off and handed them to me. Shortly after this, about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, I was overboard myself, and after swimming around a while, I landed in a lifeboat that was awash. That is about a foot or less of the ends of this boat were out of the water. Now, as the official temperature of this water was 30 degrees, I th then I am positive that I could never have held on for over eight hours if my hands had not been covered. So I would like to credit the chaplain good with helping me to save my life, as it was only two of us who survived out of about 40 that was, that was on that boat. Uh, I also want to show you, in addition to this letter, what I was just showing, uh, that there, there was, an, uh, there's a, there was a, 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 a publishing house that was created in 1946 uh, called the Living Bible Corporation. And they uh, did a whole, uh, if you will, comic book presentation on the chaplains at war that uh, focused on the four chaplains. Uh, in the background of this slide, you can see some of the, uh, the drawings from that uh, particular booklet. And uh, also, the, you know, uh, you see the, the stamps were mentioned by Stephen Collis. Well, here are the actual stamps in use. Uh, we have several postcards uh, that, uh, and, and uh, the country, uh, the post office made these postcards to immortalize the chaplains. You can see this is from 1948. This particular one was mailed in 1948. And uh, I want to draw your attention to the postcard on the left, where uh, you have a drawing and it says the painting is by Dudley Summers. I'll uh, blow that up. And uh, this man, Dudley Summers, who lived from 1892 to 1975, was uh, a, an illustrator. And he did work for uh, the Saturday Evening Post and for Red Book and for Cosmopolitan. He drew for magazines. And he was commissioned by the National Conference of Christians and Jews to draw this particular image, which uh, Professor Collis described so well in his presentation. And I do want to blow it up even more so you can see the actual image. It's, it really is gripping. Uh, so this was something, you see the men in the water in the foreground and the chaplains uh, uh, holding on to the very end of the boat as it's described in Professor Collis's book. 
And last but not least, uh, this is a program honoring uh, Rabbi Good uh, from his high school. And we have that here in our collection. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is the cover of it and the last page with this quote from uh, Malachi. Uh, the uh, Jews uh, use the quote from Malachi. Uh, Have we not all one father? Has not one God created all of us? I want to point out, I'm going to go back a little bit to, whoops, whoops, whoops. I'm going to go back to here. Uh, well, maybe it's easier to see it from here. You see at the top of the picture on the postcard, the quote is from the New Testament, from the book of John. Uh, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Uh, so the postcard, the American postcard, uses the New Testament quote, but uh, as we go to uh, uh, the uh, memorial service, they uh, honoring Rabbi Good, they go to the prophets. And uh, this is uh, the program, shows you what was done in 1946 at a William Penn Senior High School. So uh, there you have it, friends. And, and uh, I will return to this slide in just a minute to help you uh, uh, determine how you can get your hands on the immortals. So now we're all together. Professor Collis, if you'll uh, introduce our uh, special guests. Sure. So I'll start. So I, um, as I was doing my research, I, I wanted to learn so much more about Charles. I needed to learn his family background and where he came from and, and, and how he ended up enlisting and all of those things. And so I got online and I found uh, Sharon David, who worked at an accounting firm. I thought there's a chance here. I, I might have the right person. And uh, I reached out to her and she was Charles's granddaughter. Uh, and and we connected and we talked. And throughout the summer of 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, uh, she was able to provide me just so much information that really got me started in hunting the whole family history down and where they came from and everything else. That was And so that was helpful. So there's Sharon. Hi, Sharon. And she'll be talking in just a minute. And then... As I researched Charles, I learned so much more about what was happening on that Coast Guard cutter, and in particular about Robert Anderson uh, and uh, how he had been so heroic in going out onto the lifeboat to try to save people, and then how the ship had gone away. And I wanted to learn more about him. Uh, I only I didn't really know much other than that Charles and he had both been involved. I didn't know any of the details, and I don't remember how. Uh, but I found Adam Artiglare online. He is uh, Robert's grandson. I don't remember how I figured out he was who he was, but I sent him an email and asked him, were you related at all to this Robert Anderson? And he immediately reached back. I was able to connect with him and his mom, Gail, and they were able to give me even more details and, and love letters between Robert and, uh, and his sweetheart, who were just, had just been married at the time. Um, and they helped me figure all this out. So here we have the descendants of so many of the heroes that night, uh, Sharon, of course, of Charles, and then Adam and Gail, descendants of one of the men Charles helped save, who he himself also helped save a number of other men. So I'd love to hand it over to you, and maybe you can share what this whole story has meant to you, what it's meant to your families. And uh, Sharon, maybe we can start with you, whatever you'd like to say. Hi. Um, this is actually the first time, and I'm so glad that you did get in contact with me so that you can get a better perspective of the man that he was. Uh, this is the first time that both sides of the story have been told and not just one. And it's not that my grandfather didn't get any recognition back then because he did get recognized, but the story just didn't include him. So Stephen, Mr. Collis, thank you very much for uh, stopping your stopping the production of your book to include my grandfather in it, because I think I'm his side of the story should be told as well. You know, I've always said, you know, while the chaplains were praying, my grandfather was answering that prayer. Maybe uh, uh, Sharon, if you don't mind, would you tell us a little bit about how you used to hear about this from your mom? <laughs> And, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, just, just uh, uh, you know, how it uh, 
played a role in your life a little bit? I think people would find that so interesting. My um, grandfather died when my dad was three years old. So my grandmother became a wife, a mother, and a widow within a three-year period. Uh, she's done many radio stations and like I said, lots of articles in the paper. So she clipped all the articles and made sure that she had everything for my father so that he would always know who his dad was. And of course, you know, at that point, my father would pass that down to me as soon as I could read. He started showing me the different articles about my grandfather so that, so that I knew who he was and, and the type of man that he was. Um, I would say that if he lived today, he'd be that guy that would run into a burning building because he would hear someone screaming. So that was just the kind of man he was. He didn't care, you know, who you were, what color you were. It was it was a human life. And, and if he could do something to help that person, uh, that's what he did. I, I sometimes say to myself, I don't know if I could have jumped in something which would be considered a glass of ice water constantly. I mean, the conditions were terrible out there, but he volunteered. He didn't, he wasn't, he didn't have to. Like you said, he was a cook. And most of the people that were out there that he was saving probably hated him for the color of his skin. So something, if I could if I could add something that Sharon said, um we have a picture. I know Sharon has it. I have it, but I can't find it to show it right now. But uh, of uh her father as a three-year-old boy and his mom together getting an award from the Coast Guard recognizing Charles for his sacrifice. And it was the same award they gave the chaplains. But something Sharon said reminded me when that when that man was giving that award, it was the highest award you could give someone who died in a non-combat situation. And as he was giving this award, he paused and he said, now I want to emphasize Charles was in a was in a combat situation. You know, we may not consider it combat, but jumping into that frigid water as cold as it was was the same as going in and trying to save someone under fire. And he paused to make that point. So I think Sharon is right about how heroic it really was to do that. Yeah, and I, I thank you so much for sharing that, Sharon. And as you know, uh, the American Jewish Archives wanted to participate in uh, honoring uh, Black History Month. And uh, as Professor Collis said, uh, this is the 80th anniversary of that tragedy that we discussed this afternoon. And it's also the last few days of uh, Black History Month. And uh, I, I, I think uh, we all know that, um, uh, you know, there was all this talk during World War II about uh, Hitler and uh, his his uh, bigotry uh, and and uh, cruelty and so forth. But then uh, African Americans who served and fought bravely uh, in the military came home to an America that uh, did not recognize them as equal citizens either. And this begins, of course, in the 1950s. We start to see the beginning of the civil rights era. Uh, a struggle which, as we all know, goes on to this very day. And so uh, uh, I thank you very much for this and for being with us. And you have every reason to be so proud of your, uh, uh, of, of your patrimony. You really do. And uh, so I'd love to hear that the same, uh, a same uh, 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 I'd ask the same question to the Articleers that, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about the role that, uh, you know, this story played and what you may have heard about uh, Charles David and about your, you know, your, your uh, uh, grandfather, uh, your father, your grandfather, Adam, and your uh, father, Gail. I'd love to hear that story. Well, I would like to say that Charles David was our family's guardian angel. We always were taught that. Growing up, we would not have existed without what he did that night for my father. And um, I have cherished the story. It, although my father did not speak of World War II very often, he it was a, a very painful uh, time in his life. And um, he did, as I grew older and my brother and I uh, were old enough to 
understand what, what had happened. We He shared um, some of the memorabilia, but he really didn't um, talk about it very much. He just let what he gave us speak. And my son, Adam, uh, was a history major, and he was always very interested in, in this um, story of our, of our of my dad. And uh, I uh, just, uh, swirls, words cannot express our gratitude to Charles David and what he did. Um, yeah, but, uh, I'm Adam, I'm Gable's um, son, and, and um, I want to thank um, the American Jewish Archives um, and also uh, the other Brown Railroad Freedom Center for putting this on and, and, and hosting this and having, giving us an opportunity um, and, and Professor Powell's an opportunity to tell the story. Uh, we want to shout the story in the mountaintops and every opportunity that we can. Um, it is, and, and, and the reason why um, it is. The reason why it's so important, um, sorry, I'm sorry, I think that people may have trouble hearing me, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, but, I think if you come close to the uh, screen a little bit closer, we'll be able to hear you better. Sure, I'll just talk a little bit louder. Um, Great. But yeah, and, and, and so I, I, want, I want to, again, thank um, uh, the American Jewish Archives um, for uh, hosting this. And the importance of Charles David in our life um, and the lives of our family can't be understated um, or overstated. It's, it's something that is so important to us. Um, and we have the last name like Marty Blair rather than my grandfather's name, Anderson. It's easier for us to be found uh, by um, uh, Professor Collis when he was doing his research. And we're so happy that he did because um, we, you know, had already connected um, back with Sharon. Um, uh, when the Coast Guard commissioned uh, the Coast Guard cutter Charles David uh, uh, Jr. and and we're we're very happy about that um, and it, it just the opportunity to be able to, to express this now um, that night was a terrible night um, for many people uh, you know almost 700 people lost their lives um, when the Dorchester sank um, and and Charles David lost his life um, uh, a few days later due to um, the work that he did that night. Um, he not only volunteered for this, um, you know, what, what could be and what eventually was a fatal mission um, for him, um, but he did so um, in front of other men um, who had higher ranks than he did, and who he cut meals for every day. It was the job that he had on the hook. Um, and for somebody like that to step up and to do that and to jump in the water over and over again. Um, and then when at, at the time that my grandfather was being left behind, um, actually going up and having the wherewithal um, to tell the captain of the ship and the commanding officer that somebody was being left behind. If you can imagine the, the force of will that somebody has in order to do that and, and convince people that that's something you know, if he did not do that, I wouldn't be here today. Um, and, and so not only just that and, and everything else, we're just very grateful to Charles David and, and um, also we're grateful that his story is being told finally. And, and of course, we're so grateful to have Sharon in our lives. And she's just a wonderful person. Um, and, and we're so grateful. Thank you very much for telling us. Well, thank you very much. Uh... You know, I want to remind the uh, folks who are still listening and we have a good audience still listening. I think we all know, or at least I'd like to hearken us back to the beginning of uh, Professor Collis's presentation where he was talking, if you recall, about the atmosphere that prevailed in America prior to the war and uh, Hitler's uh, point of view that America uh, was so filled with hate and bigotry that it could not unite, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, to stand up to a unified uh, one race, if you will, people. And uh, uh, of course, uh, the chaplains become uh, the story, a sort of a poster child, if you will, to uh, as a response to that. 
And uh, we add in now the story of Charles David uh, uh, and it's, it's it, the conglomerate, which is why I think this was such a wonderful idea to hold the book and add in the story of Charles David, or as Sharon, as you put it, the other side of the story, which was not necessarily told to put those two together because it is not only an answer to what Nazism and Hitler stood for, but when you think about the way America is today with its polarized nation, uh, with uh, uh, so much uh, difficulty that we're facing today, uh, you know, we talk as historians about what we call the usable past, past that should be put to good use to help us today. And these are stories that are not make believe, they're not fairy tales, they are real people and had real consequences. And, uh, and uh, I think we can use this past uh, to inspire us uh, for. Uh, in the world in which we live today. If, uh, if, uh, if there are uh, people who, um, who uh, would doubt that we can unify, well, all you have to do is hold up the four chaplains and hold up uh, Charles Good, and you have an answer to that. Well, I think uh, I'm gonna call on my colleague, Dr. Dana Herman. She's hopefully been collecting some questions and we'll spend about 10 minutes trying to answer some questions if there are some. And, uh, and, uh, and then we will end. I promise we begin on time and we'll end on time. So uh, Dr. Herman, what do you have to say? Um, so yeah, there were lots of comments, lots of reminiscences of people who knew Rabbi Good and knew his uh, widow and his daughter. So that was really nice. Um, some questions, if 200 men were saved, uh, just if you can repeat how many were lost, how many died that day? Um, there was about 648 or so who passed away that night. And I, I should emphasize that was the worst troop carrying disaster for the United States in World War II in both theaters. So it's important that while we're recognizing and remembering the chaplains and Charles David and those who survived to recognize how many families lost their loved ones that night. A lot of people died that night. Um, and is there a marker or memorial for Mr. David and for Mr. Anderson? Where is Mr. Anderson buried? And is there a marker for Mr. David? I'll let, our, I'll let Sharon and uh, one of the article layers answer those questions. David, I, Charles actually has a really fascinating story with that, Sharon, if you want to share that. But uh, the article layers can talk about Robert. Yes. Um, my grandfather was originally buried in Greenland. Um, he's now in the Long Island National Cemetery. Uh, I was born and raised in the Bronx, and my grand my grandmother thought that my grandfather died at sea because no one ever told us where he was buried. Um, we didn't find out till early 2000 that he was buried in the Long Island Cemetery, which was a spit shot from the Bronx. So we never even knew that he was there. Hmm. Yeah. And he was, and if I understand, there was a coast wasn't it a Coast Guard historian, Sharon, who really started digging into his history and doing research and then yes, found that, that, that he'd was, been back to Greenland and had him moved? That was Judge Sachs. Judge right. Sachs um, did some very extensive uh, research on my grandfather. He actually went over to Greenland to, to look for his gravesite and found it empty and had to come back over here and find out where it was. So that's why I said, we had no clue. I thought my grandfather was buried at sea or something and didn't even know that he had a physical uh, grave site. And actually the Long Island uh, National Cemetery doesn't even recognize him as a hero. He's not on their list at all. Maybe you can work to change that. So, so, so they don't even have, they don't even have any, any history on him and uh, Pretty disappointed, but it is what it is. Well, that sounds like something that could be worked on and rectified. Yeah, I would think so. And how about how about your grandfather or your dad? If if could y'all hear me better now? Yes, much better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, my my grandfather lived a very long life, thanks to Charles David, um, and died in two thousand and three in Lakeland, Florida, um, and um, his ashes were scattered. Um, in the Gulf of Mexico um, near Boca Grande. This is one of his favorite places to be um, in Florida. So uh, there is 
not a marker or anything else for my grandfather, but, you know, I mean, if, and we will work um, with uh, Sharon and the Davids to see what we can do about uh, uh, getting them listed. And we're working on a number of different projects and we will continue to do so in order to give him the recognition that he needs um, and deserves. Great. The next question is from Professor Collis. Um, are there any, were you in touch with any descendants of the chaplains? Yes, as many as I could find. Um, and I should emphasize too, there is the, somebody had mentioned in the chat to, to, to mention the Chapel of the Four Chaplains, which is in Philadelphia. They just had a commemoration of all of this as well. And, and many of the descendants were there, including um, Clark Ch uh, Chaplain Poling's daughter, um, she was there and his, some of his grandchildren. So, um, the chapel of the four chaplains is a place where they each year try to remember this. And they just created the Charles David distinguished service memorial award, which they are going to be giving out, uh, now annually in recognition of Charles that night. Wonderful. I think that was, that's all the questions we had. Well, we a minute, Gary, can I show yeah. one picture real fast? Absolutely. People are interested. So I think this is, am I, is that photo popping up? Yes. So here's Sharon's dad as a little boy, her grandmother, and then Adam and Gail, is that your, is that Robert? Absolutely. Yes. It's my dad, my, uh, my dad. So this is all of them together. Uh, uh, receiving the award for Charles. So, you know, obviously a very solemn and sad moment, but very, very, very close on the heels of that tragic night. Um, and then was it, uh, I think, 2013 that the Coast Guard named a cutter, the Charles W. David Jr. cutter, which is probably out protecting our shore somewhere right now off the coast. But here's a picture of, of folks together, if, if people are interested. And I have that in the back of the book, I think. Yes, you do have it in the book. Uh, that's wonderful. And and in fact, speaking of the book, uh, I am going to uh, uh, share my screen again and uh, show everybody um, uh, how they can get the book. So let me bring that up. Uh, all right, we able to see that okay? Whoops. Everybody able to see that okay? Okay, great. So if you would like to purchase a copy of this book, uh, here's what we do. Uh, tomorrow when you receive um, your uh, uh, notice from Zoom about this webinar, uh, you, you can let us know, we will ask you, you can let us know if you would like Professor Collis to sign a, uh, a, 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 an insert for the book. Uh, if you want us to do that, we'll send that to Professor Collis. You can order the book. You see the URL at the bottom of your screen, shadowmountain.com. You can order a book and then Professor Collis will personalize, uh, if you would like, will personalize uh, a, an insert that can be stuck into your book and then uh, we can go from there. So this is again, uh, shadowmountain.com. And uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, just, if I could, I'd like to uh, conclude the seminar, uh, webinar and uh, just uh, take an opportunity one last time to thank our guests, to thank Stephen Collis, and, uh, and of course, to uh, uh, Sharon David and to Gail uh, uh, Artiglier and to uh, uh, Adam Artiglier. And uh, uh, thank you so much for being with us and for sharing with us. Uh, thanks to the Freedom Center, to the Jewish Community Relations Council and the American Jewish Committee. And finally, thanks to all of you who have uh, given up some of your time this afternoon to be with us. Uh, we're very grateful. Uh, 
You know the AJA will continue to sponsor these special webinars on American Jewish experience. In the coming months, uh, we will have a series of them, including in May, which is going to be, as everybody knows, Jewish American Heritage Month. So keep your eyes peeled for our webinars. Uh, and finally, finally, let me offer up my gratitude to the amazing, remarkable staff and administration of the American Jewish Archives. In particular, Ms. Lisa Frankel. For those of you who are missing Lisa, she's homesick. But I also want to thank uh, Dr. Dana Herman and also Mr. Joe Weber, all of whom helped to make this as smooth as, as it could be. Uh, please remember, tomorrow you'll get a reminder from Zoom about the webinar and uh, you can go from there. You can uh, see the recording of this webinar and please don't forget to visit the Hebrew Union College's special online learning portal where you'll find eventually the, the recording of this uh, particular webinar and many other fascinating learning opportunities. So friends, thank you, Professor Collis. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Gail. Thanks for a wonderful, inspiring end to Black History Month and uh, an appropriate commemoration of the 80th anniversary of this terrible tragedy in, uh, in, uh, with the USTS uh, Dorchester. Uh, to one and to all, let me say thank you. Shalom, goodbye, and we look forward to seeing all of you again on another webinar in the not too distant future. Thank you so much.